Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy help define our contemporary world. My guest today, after he graduated, worked as a farmer, a shepherd in New Zealand. He graduated into public life, was a member of parliament for more than a decade, was foreign minister of New Zealand, deputy prime minister, and is now into his second term as secretary general of the Commonwealth. I'm delighted to welcome Don McKenna to Delhi. Um, you were here for a meeting on, that looks at development and democracy, a colloquium, uh, which you know, the Prime Minister of India will be uh, is, is involved and associated with. Uh, democracy has been a, 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 a huge issue uh, with the Commonwealth, and, and you know, every now and then, you know, whether it's issues of Pakistan or Fiji or uh, Zimbabwe, um, it's, 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 it's a major issue. Why do you see democracy as being so vital to development? I mean, I, I, I sort of circumscribe this question by saying that, you know, th th there is a view in India that, that believes that we have paid a heavy price with democracy and that that has impeded development. And this issue keeps coming up that much more when we, can, when we compare India's progress with China. Mm. So tell us, why do you see democracy as being so important to development? Well, I think uh, using your analogy, of course, <laughs> I, I, you know, the Chinese might well say, well, you, you need about 100 years to really make a judgment on something like this. Uh, we, we've got enough proof in the Commonwealth and in many, many countries that where there have been relatively open democratic structures, people feeling involved in their own country, the development has been more assured and more beneficial than where there have been real restrictions. So we can, I think, candidly say, if you put the two together, you tend to be that much better off. Now, you'll always be able to find an example of the contrary, I'm sure. Uh, but nevertheless, people being involved in their country, feeling they are participating in some way, it may only be a vote once every three or four years, but if they feel that, they feel they have a claim, uh, they make demands, they, they have expectations, and invariably they create a, a level of confidence about development. But, you know, when you use the word democracy, democracy is, uh, is you know, you sort of had these, these large numbers of, you know, communist countries with totalitarian regimes, you know, that, that frequently describe themselves as democratic socialist republics. Uh, so in, 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 in what ways do you understand the practice and functioning of democracy and, 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 and why is it, is it important in its unfolding? Well, I, I mean, look, I can candidly say I look at India and I see, I see India as one of democratic successes. I mean, the fact that, that you can have regular elections in this country, have a transfer of power from one government to another in a country of more than a billion people is actually truly remarkable. Truly, it's a great example because no one can say we are too big for it or, you know, we are too unmanageable, the fact that India has succeeded. But I think the important part of your question is, do, you, do people have greater aspirations for themselves? And the fact is they do. No matter where people are, they do usually want life a little bit better for themselves and more particularly for their kids. They want the education, they want the health they will generally only get that in a way if, if they are involved in their country. And, and democracy comes in many forms. We're often told that, you know, the Westminster system, there's one Westminster government and that's in Westminster. All the rest are different variations on what they believe is, or should be responsive to the people themselves. When those countries that you referred to came out of communistic rule, there were a remarkable variety of sort of structures that developed. Some worked, some didn't. Some being redesigned, some being rebuilt. But in all trying to be, in a way, responsive to the people's needs. Do you think it's sort of, you know, ironic? People often wonder about the, you know, the origins of the Commonwealth. It was, you know, it was India's Prime Minister Nehru uh, who felt that it was important for this, this sort of sense of community, of fraternity uh, of people who had uh, been under sort of British Raj that uh, you know, uh, countries in their post-colonial uh, experience and, and um, unfolding over several decades uh, should really work so hard to celebrate democracy when their origins really what brought them together was Anything colonial about exploitation and yeah. was very sort of antithetical yeah. uh, to that. And that uh, the queen, who <coughs> sort of, uh, or the emperor, or whoever was in, in history, who embodied that sort of titular and, 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 and colonial authority, should continue to remain uh, as its head. Uh, how do you reconcile these? 
Well, the answer is not easily, <laughs> because it is. You, there, are, there are some, obviously, conflicts there. Uh, the Queen, head of the Commonwealth, it's a titular role. Uh, uh, it's there, uh, no one's about to change it, uh, and her role is, is a very quiet one. Uh, all leaders appreciate meeting her, I've found, all appreciate uh, having discussions with her. Uh, but she's never given any direction to me or anyone <laughs> else, I'm sure, about uh, you know, what should be happening. I think if, you, if we take a step back and say, you're a country that's just become independent, uh, you're looking around and say to yourself, well, how do we relate with our neighbours? How do we relate with other, uh, the international community? And the answer is you tend to join clubs. You join clubs that might be in your region. They may be a club that has a relationship with your ethnic groups or your religious groups. It may be sub-national, sub-regional. And that's where we see that uh, those that have joined the Commonwealth generally find it a useful group to belong to. And if they want benefits uh, externally, they will often use those Commonwealth linkages. That's not to say that uh, India will always use the UN. It'll use SARC. It'll use other organizations it belongs to. The Commonwealth is one of those organizations. And it, to me, it's really up for the country themselves do they make the most of the international organizations they belong to? It's a large, a large question and only to sort of, uh, you know, point uh, to some aspects of it. What is the value uh, of, of being a member uh, of the Commonwealth? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends sort of who you are and what you are. If you're a small country, you have quite a job making yourself heard in the world today. So you can actually help amplify your voice. Uh, if you're in the Pacific or the Caribbean or even the Indian Ocean, you can join together with others. And within the Commonwealth setting, you know, you can, you can magnify that voice considerably. So our group of small states, 34, they would get lost internationally in many cases if it wasn't for using the Commonwealth as a grouping to make themselves heard. For medium-sized nations, they get the opportunity, I think, to extend their external influence at quite a low cost. They can't afford to have 150 embassies around the world or consulates around the world, but they have their 20 or 30, and they can often make up for the balance by using those Commonwealth links. And what about the large countries? If you're one of the big guys... Australia, I, India... <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. From time to time, you want to initiate something in the UN. I mean, it's no, no, no secret. India has aspirations in the UN for Security Council seat right now. So what is, what the, Commonwealth, is, the, what is the Commonwealth's position? No, is there a Commonwealth no, position no, on the UN? I'm seat. saying, what better way is <laughs> India to use those other 52 countries to garner support for them? Now, that is happening all the time, whether it's India for the Security Council, whether it's Australia on a trade issue, whether it's Canada on a on a peace initiative, whether it's the United Kingdom. But you won't get off the hook on this. What, is there a Commonwealth position on India's seeking I don't membership? Think, I don't think the Commonwealth has, has taken a position on Secretary General Kofi Annan's Security Council report. We have, a, the report has been around for about a year, but the Commonwealth hasn't addressed it as such. Now, whether they want to or not is quite another thing. But what I say is that the big countries often use that membership of 53 other countries for their own purposes, and so they should. You're watching a conversation with the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Don McKinnon. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to a continuing conversation with the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Um, you were talking about the large countries and, 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 and being able to use this. Very often there is this conflict between bilateral issues and, and, and the multilateral ones. And I think that uh, you know, there's this particular sensitivity in, 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 in India about sort of our relations with Pakistan and the role of the Commonwealth. Um, Pakistan has been in and out of the Commonwealth for its sort of failure of democracy and the restoration of democracy. Uh, it's sort of an ambivalent situation at the present time. You know, Pakistan is still on a, on a kind of watch uh, whether, you know, how effectively democracy uh, will unfold. Uh, how influential a role do you think that uh, the Commonwealth is able to play in being able to persuade nations 
uh, to embrace uh, democracy. Is that influence strong enough to overcome sort of, you know, the imperatives of the military dictator who just wants to stay in power and says, you know, the hell with the Commonwealth? Look, I can say that uh, it was the Commonwealth that did suspend Pakistan from its uh, membership in 1999 uh, on the basis of the, the issue of General Musharraf taking over what was a reasonably freely elected government. Now, I can say also that any time this happens within the Commonwealth, there is immediately a period of no speaks. You know, we don't like you, you don't like us, we're not going to talk to you. After a period of time, you usually find that a little bit of dialogue begins. And we were able to uh, get alongside uh, uh, General Musharraf, who then became President Musharraf, and talk about the things that the Commonwealth could do to help Pakistan come back to the Commonwealth. So there was no question about Pakistan not wanting to come back to the Commonwealth. So what are the kind of things that uh, the Commonwealth could do, did do, to help Pakistan get back? Well, uh, for instance, uh, the Commonwealth said, you know, you must have uh, elections uh, very soon. And after a long lot of discussions, uh, President Mosharraf agreed, and I think under a degree of Commonwealth influence, to produce a road map from the beginning of the year how he would go through the process of ensuring the elections that were ultimately held in October towards the end of the year. So we were able to bring in people who could help with, with a level of expertise on electoral processes. We had election observers there at the time. Since the suspension on, uh, on Pakistan has been lifted, we've been even more engaged and it's been even more appreciated because Pakistan has realized that that Commonwealth network of countries throughout the, the Pacific, the Caribbean, and Africa, Europe, Asia, is a pretty useful network to keep in contact with, apart from a general interest in cricket. <laughs> and what will it take uh, for uh, Pakistan to get off this sort of watch? Well, it's, it's on the agenda of the Ministerial Action Group, and the ministers there can, can lift it at any time, but they have said uh, President Musharraf, you said you would uh, uh, cease to be the operational commander of the armed forces. Uh, you changed your mind on that one. We will leave you on the agenda. You've said that that will terminate anyway in 07. Uh, let's have a look at it leading up to that time. Mm -hmm. Amongst the sort of many initiatives that uh, you've taken have been on, you know, the Doha round of talks, uh, looking at, uh, you know, s subsidies of uh, d d d d developed countries and how that impacts uh, trade and, and the futures of uh, developing countries. Uh, how do you reconcile the interests of, of the larger countries in the Commonwealth, uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, India, uh, well, uh, you know, who have far greater influence and, and the larger ec economies in some senses than the, s the smaller countries, um, when they follow so such different patterns of development? I mean, if the, if the poorer countries were to aspire to the levels of consumption of the United Kingdom or Australia, you know, the planet would collapse. <laughs> so how do you begin to r reconcile these, uh, you know, within this club? Well, I think if we were talking at the, towards the end of the Uruguay round, the last big trade round, I would say the Commonwealth probably would be utterly irrelevant because most Commonwealth countries were going in different directions on that issue. On the Doha development round, there has been a genuine determination. This must be a genuine development round. There must be development benefits from it. Now, all countries in the Commonwealth are in agreement on that. There's some variation on how to get there, but it's minor by comparison. So there is a lot of unity in the Commonwealth on this. Taking into account, of course, this Doha round will ultimately have more impact on more people inside more countries than any other trade round has. So there is an interest to get it right. And we find that within the Commonwealth, a lot of our countries are just too small to have the expertise to deal with some of these very major and very technical issues. So we have now quite a, a major program, 17 million euro program, on helping a lot of our countries with international trade legal expertise in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, in Africa, in Asia, uh, to ensure that countries are in a position not necessarily to actually influence the finality of the round, but to know what can happen to them as a result of some big decisions. And if the Commonwealth is very clear on a couple of major ones, 
it's greater trade access for developing countries and a very early elimination of those export subsidies, particularly in Europe, United States and Japan, which totally distort a lot of world commodity trade. To what degree uh, do you think that uh, the Commonwealth is able to, in this larger comity uh, of nations uh, and, and the many clubs uh, that, that you have mentioned, where increasingly it seems to be sort of military power uh, that, 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 that supports these alliances uh, that that, that give it authority and credibility. So something as, as loosely structured as, as the Commonwealth is, what is the basis of its uh, influence? Shall I say? Well, <laughs> military power has always played a major role, whether, whether very obvious or very, very below the surface. So we come with no battalions whatsoever. But we have developed over the period of our life of some 50 plus years, as you say, since uh, since uh, Mr. Nehru decided that India, a republic, would be part of the Commonwealth, that the Commonwealth has a certain sort of moral authority on good governance, on democratic institutions that are truly representative and deliver what is expected of the people, that we advocate that kind of transparency. And we can only do it through encouragement and, and sort of indirect incentives we don't have any battalions to say, if you don't do this, this is going to happen to you. But we find we can be successful. Uh, you know, back in the early 1990s, there were probably 12 to 15 either military or single party dictators in the Commonwealth. I don't believe there's any there now. Uh, we've gone through a lot of electoral processes, a lot of good elections. There are still a lot of weaknesses in our democratic institutions throughout the Commonwealth. But it is a day-to-day -day kind of make it work improve it, ensure that your people do understand that uh, these institutions are your institutions. They're there to benefit you, not necessarily the people in charge. You're watching a conversation with Don McKinnon, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. I'm sorry to go back to this issue of, of, of democracy uh, because it is so much a part of uh, global discourse, discussion and debate where um, uh, you know, certainly in the Middle East and the Arab world, uh, you know, democracy is seen as an alien concept that um, certain civilizations and countries who have military power seek to impose uh, on them. And uh, you know, it, it, it's fortuitous in the sense that you know, India's, no, India's idea and experience of democracy is in, in, in harmony and in sync uh, with, this, with this notion and with this idea. How do you go about uh, promoting uh, democracy, uh, uh, convincing, I don't know what, populations, governments, uh, that uh, democracy is really um, suitable <coughs> and, and an ideal for them? There are obviously yeah. people who resent it and resist it. Well, there are some very vocal people on that one, but you've probably got to go a bit deeper and uh, go and talk to people in, in some villages in those countries, small towns in those countries, and ask those people, are you satisfied that you are getting what you want from the government of this country? Do you feel you have a say in your kids' education, in your health services, in your roads and in your infrastructure? If you feel you have a say, whether you're man, woman, or, or um, someone even in, in their late teens. Uh, if you feel you don't have a say, do you not want to have a say? Do you say, no, I'm leaving it to someone else forever? Or do you aspire to, to have some influence? And I don't think there's very few people in the world who don't want to have some influence on their way of life. And that's really the beginning of a democracy. There are people who will resist it. There are people who say, no, it is not within our ethnicity, it's not within our history, it's not within our culture, it's not within our religion. By and large, most people, a very large proportion, usually say we want to have some say in the way things work around here. And so, in many cases, it's going to take a long time to change many things. In the Commonwealth, I've been involved in two or three of our member countries uh, where the change that we've been encouraging has been resisted often on cultural grounds, often on traditional grounds, historical grounds. But slowly and surely, people are saying, no, we want to have more say. 
we want to have more say in our lives. Let me sort of steer this in, in the closing moments of the program to sort of a more personal question. Tell me, as, as, as a Secretary General, uh, do you find, uh, do you feel ever frustrated that in terms of your perceptions, your agendas of what is right, what the Commonwealth should do and might do, do they sometimes seem at odds or, or, or end up being at odds with what ministers and governments decide you should do? Well, you know, I, 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 I went into elected politics, you know, more than 20, 25 years ago. And when you, become, well, when you become a new member of parliament, you honestly believe you're going to change the world. Uh, you pretty soon find out that you're one of many people who want to change the world, let alone your own country, your own community. You eventually learn how to work the systems to your advantage. And here we have 53 countries in the Commonwealth. They're all a little bit different. They've all come from a different place, a different source, a different background, different history. By and large, their similarities are actually greater than their differences. You can work with them. You can encourage them. You can show that by taking a certain course, there are real benefits. But we have to be able to show benefits. It's no use saying to people, you must have democracy, and then 10 years later, uh, they're worse off uh, in terms of per capita incomes. Democracy must show benefits. So oh, it's encumbrance okay. upon us to be able to make it work. How is the personal experience different, uh, you know, working uh, as, as uh, would it be fair to describe you as, as, as a politician in your current incarnation? Because the question really was, that how is it different working without sort of your, your constitu electoral constituency looking over your shoulder uh, as you know, when, when you were in electoral politics and, and, and foreign minister and deputy prime minister in parliament as opposed to being uh, with, with the Commonwealth? Well, I've got, I've got a constituency <laughs> of 53 heads of government who, who watch very closely what I do. So, you know, they are my bosses. Uh, and I've got to make sure that everything we do in the Commonwealth, by and large, is supported by them. If I start doing things that just antagonize them, well, I'll be a very short-lived Secretary General. But that's not difficult. It is a case of managing expectations, uh, keeping people informed as to what you're doing, being relevant. What, is the co what the Commonwealth is doing today may be quite different to what it was doing 10 years ago. What is your personal sense of you know, mission, agenda, uh, for the Commonwealth at this time. Uh, you, know, you know, democracy is something that, that, that keeps coming up, you know, issues of development. Uh, you know, at one stage it was, um, you know, combating up, up apartheid in South Africa, became, you know, the, 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 the Zimbabwe began to dominate the headlines. And at, at different times in the Commonwealth history there have been sort of dominant themes and issues. What is the most dominant agenda that you have that, that will give you the most gratification when you lay down office? Well, I think it's the things we're talking about right now. If I, if I can see more kids getting education, more kids having opportunities in their own countries, in their own communities, that to me will be a, a major difference. Because too often I see now, you know, I see little kids on the side of the road in various parts, and I say to myself, I wouldn't like that to be my kid because that kid's got no future at all. We, we've got to give these people a lot more future, a lot more confidence, because there are enormous benefits there if we can do that. You still have uh, you know, several years of your second tenure left, and there may be a third and a fourth. But what, do, what does one do after you've been Secretary General? What do, you, what do you aspire to after you've been Secretary General of the company? Well, look, I'm not a 25-year-old, <laughs> and I'm only allowed to have two terms anyway. So. Uh, <laughs> I do have to go leave the Secretariat uh, in about and two and a half years' time. is there an ambition and aspiration beyond that? Oh, I had an aspiration when I was about 17. I wanted to own my own farm. I've yet to actually accede to that aspiration. <laughs> I've, I've deviated in my, uh, my course of activity through life. and uh, So maybe there's a, there's a small farm somewhere in New Zealand I'm still heading for. Well, good luck and thank you very much. This has been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.